Hi, Sam. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Good to be back. Good to have you on again, and uh, good to have a new book of yours to talk about. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio uh, podcast. You are Samuel Moyne, uh, professor of law and history at Yale, author of a number of books. The one we're going to talk about is called Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. Um, now, what I wanted to do is. Uh, kind of quickly capsulize your argument and then apply it to kind of current events and then step back and talk about the, the historical sweep of the overall argument, if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Okay, so let me see if I've got the basic argument right. Um, it's, it's that the growing emphasis on fighting war humanely, on avoiding civilian casualties and so on, has displaced, in some sense, emphasis on ending wars or avoiding them in the first place. So the, the you know, kind of like uh, humane war activism, is it in some sense at odds with old fashioned anti-war activism? Um, and it isn't just activism. I mean, as we'll discuss, you, you know, you're, 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 you talk about trends in, in international law uh, and, and so on. Um, but that's this, so far, is that uh, a fair summary? And what would you like to add? No, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, I'm, I think it's hard to kind of prove a kind of displacement claim. And I'd be the first to acknowledge that in certain situations, can't stop a war. Maybe it's just a fight, one or two, although I haven't seen it lately. Um, uh, uh, but at other times, there's this risk. And we've seen not just activists who set up the situation, but even presidents who try to legitimate ongoing war by assuring us that, um, you know, the only alternative is brutal war. So why don't you accept the humane war I've brought uh, online. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's really about the powerful and not just those challenging the powerful, um, you know, in, in a kind of difficult situation. Okay. So to apply it to the current moment, um, you know, what's called uh, forever wars continue. We, we are out of Afghanistan, but uh, we have, you know, non-trivial troop contingents in Iraq and Syria, special forces in a lot of places. Every once in a while, they kill somebody, but we may or may not hear about it. Um, and drone strikes, we may or may not hear about, but they happen in a number of uh, countries. And, you know, one thing that hadn't really crystallized in my mind before, before uh, I actually listened to, didn't read your book, but I listened to the Audible version. Um, uh, before listening to your book, is that uh, we do, there, there is a tension on the drone strikes uh, to the extent that they cause civilian casualties, but nobody, almost nobody ever asks, are the, are the, are the strikes legitimate and lawful in the first place? Is this particular group that we designated a terrorist group uh, targetable under American law, under international law. And I didn't quite realize how tenuous the argument is under national law in some cases until, uh, in, until listening to your book. Um, you want to just take that in any direction you want to. I mean, I mean, you can just, just well, any, any direction you want to take that in. Sure. So I think it's still relevant. Um, hard to read the tea leaves, but Joe Biden assured us uh, in his second speech in defense of the Afghan withdrawal, which, of course, we think was a great thing um, in itself, that he was ending counterinsurgency, but not ending counterterrorism. And in fact, you know, he knows that with the Taliban uh, in even in control of the rest of Afghanistan, there probably be even more need for what he called uh, over the horizon operations, which refers to missiles from armed drones or aircraft or standoffs 
uh, or the kind of really remarkable um, deployments of, of um, special forces that you mentioned and which have really mushroomed in the places they've gone since the Obama years. Um, now, there's interesting kind of congressional activity on, on this even today, and some senators, Patrick Leahy, sent a letter saying that the, the targeted killings policy ought to end, um, not just the Afghan withdrawal, which should be called forever wars ending, but a lot more and a lot of the legal authority the president has been accumulated. Now, you know, ultimately what the law is, you know, it depends on who you ask. The trouble is that the president asks his own staff who give him permission slips unfailingly, a Republican or Democrat. And they're most concerned with domestic law and less concerned with international law, just because it's less, it's, it's, it's less obtrusive and, you know, it's less reported. Um, and only a few annoying critics, especially critics outside the country or, you know, sovereign states in the global south kind of cite international law, you know, very regularly. Still, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of problems with targeted killing under both domestic and international law. Mm -hmm. um, under domestic law, you know, the AUMF, as open-ended as it was, was still about al-Qaeda. Didn't mention anyone else. And, you know, Bush and especially Obama lawyers invented and, and interpreted into the AUMF a category called associated forces, mm -hmm. which uh, even allowed them to attack enemies of al-Qaeda. Like ISIS. Uh, on the grounds that they had some spiritual connection to it. <laughs> in international law, you're right, it's a lot dicier because, you know, even in cases, and we don't know in every case, uh, in which a state consents to our operating uh, over it. Um, these are strikes that are not in, in a war zone. Um, and it's very unclear whether the United Nations Charter allows the exercise of self-defense outside uh, a, a situation that is, is, is classified as war. Some people think it requires like policing because that's in peacetime, you know, human rights law requires um, kind of the right to life uh, to be taken seriously and, all, you know, not, not the kind of laxer standards that wartime would allow. So, you know, we've, we've headed into what legally was, was like a global battlefield. Mm -hmm. Bush, Bush invented that concept, but, Obama actually lived it out and it's, it's pretty noxious, I think, you know, practically, but, uh, I think legally, you know, a lot of people have raised questions about it. Yeah. And when you said that, uh, they justified, um, targeting ISIS, even though ISIS is an enemy of Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda is the group that's targetable under the congressional authorization. Um, and you said the argument was that there was some kind of spiritual connection. Is that almost literally like what the argument is? I mean, also another point, it, it, it one thing that becomes kind of clear in, in, in through your book is, you know, the white house always, even, I think even the Trump administration, notwithstanding it's contempt for international law, the white house always goes through the motions of, of doing a legal document that justifies things under both national and international law. But these things, especially the justifications under international law, are rarely going to actually get any kind of meaningful judicial review. So they can just say pretty much anything they want. And the only question, you know, the only consequences of saying completely crazy stuff is that people like you will joke about it in faculty lounges or something, right? I mean, um, so uh, first of all, is it how, how how loose is the reasoning that justified the targeting of ISIS? And am I right that uh, this whole this whole game of White House legal justifications is pretty loosely refereed at both in terms of international law and national law? You know, it's not refereed at all, um, Bob, because uh, the, when it comes to war powers under the Constitution and under statutes like, you know, the AUMF and kind of the broader regime that, you know, Viet, 
um, brought us at the War Powers Resolution, the courts have really essentially exempted themselves from these questions uh, on the grounds that they're political. And, you know, if Congress wants to reassert itself, it should, and it's not going to get an assist from the judiciary. And that has meant that the executive is unchecked. Uh, it gets permission slips from from its own staff uh, and then goes ahead. And these are often just laughable. Um, in in the international system, it's in a sense even worse because there's there's no judiciary. Um, there there's supposed to be a system for adjudicating um, when states step beyond the prohibition of the use of force. But of course, five countries, and most especially ours, are exempted from judgment. And that gets into the deeper history. I kind of chart of how some people really wanted to design peace into the international system and succeeded very partially in, 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 in you know, it, it, in mainly because um, they ended up empowering an America, which, which didn't have to answer to the same rules as other states. Mm -hmm. And when you say five are exempt, you mean uh, five countries have vetoes, right? Uh, Security the Council resolutions. The five. Yeah. And, and it's the Security Council that actually has mm, kind of meaningful authority, you might say, as opposed to the General Assembly. Yeah. It's, so the, the, you know, the, the UN Charter kind of empowers the Security Council to um, decide when the, the peace has been breached and when. States have become aggressors in the international system, mm -hmm. and um, that was always the plan. And then the you know, the plan that never came to pass was that the Security Council would kind of direct its own multilateral police force. Um, but you know, almost essentially by definition, there are five countries that can never breach the peace. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, you see that when Russia decides to an annex the Crimea. Um, but you also see it, and you've much more regularly seen it, sadly, when the United States has been endlessly at war in the Cold War and in our time. And there's really nothing to do mm -hmm. about it. its interpretations of the law, which mm -hmm. it does cite, because Article 51 of the UN Charter requires you to, mm -hmm. to tell the Security Council that you're acting in self-defense, but that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. um... And the Iraq war, of course, a classic case where uh, pretty plainly illegal under international law. But uh, what's the Security Council going to do if, if they say anything? We're going to veto the resolution. Um, so uh, as for the state of play now, um, you know, I mean, first of all, I think you're not saying that uh, this is wor where we are is worse than, say, World War II. Two, uh, where, um, you know, we, we were firebombing cities and, and, and so on, and just the civilian casualties were horrific. Um, right. You're certainly not bemoaning uh, the evolution of uh, kind of humane international law or international humanitarian law, I guess. Is that the term of art? Uh, yeah, since the 60s, the laws of war were rebranded yeah. international humanitarian law. Uh, so you're not you're not bemoaning the the evolution and strengthening of that, or just the, the practical kind of cultural emphasis on more humane war, you're, you're noting that it seems to have come at the expense of trying to just actually end war. And, and uh, I also don't think you're saying that, um, well, you're saying on balance, I, I get you tell me, you're saying on balance, okay, maybe we're in a better place. And, and, and uh, but there's still problems. And I, I'd like you to articulate the problems a little more, because I can imagine somebody saying, sure. look, compared to World War II, compared to even the Korean War, compared to Vietnam, none of this is anything in actual human terms. It's a drop in the bucket. And quantitatively, the, I mean, now that especially now that the Iraq War is over uh, and, you know, the, the Syrian conflict uh, has wound down, they, they would be right quantitatively. This is like this is like nothing. So what do you say about why we should still be concerned about the status quo? Well, so first, structurally, um, you know, the, the, 
the events of the 1930s and 40s um, meant that uh, America signed up to guarantee the European peace, which had been so elusive before and led to millions of deaths in some of the most grotesque circumstances. And again, I'm, I think that was a good thing. Um, it's just that it meant that my country in that process signed up to a lot of global war that it had not fought before. Um, and you mean, you it, mean beginning with after world war two. Correct. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think we ought to, you know, solve, um, because it's meant letting, you know, the United States off the leash for a lot of wars of choice that have made the world worse long before the Iraq war. And again, nothing to do about it. So it's not, it's, it's designed into the system that Pax Americana involves endless American war. And then in a later period, there's a lot to celebrate, just as with the, the, the partial piece before with the humanization of war, because war was hell and now it's more humane. But there's this risk, no more than a risk to control that it's harder to end war that has been humanized. And I just think that I, 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 the, the, the experience, my experience, at least of, the, of Barack Obama's presidency, where he unfailingly advertised the, the humane virtue of the allegedly necessary wars, at least suggest that this is a factor that legitimates, you know, endlessness. And we ought to, you know, control any risk there is in the good things we do, not just in the bad things we do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so Obama represented kind of a transition in your telling uh, from kind of old fashioned war, notwithstanding his, his surge in Afghanistan, but but from old fashioned war to the kind of, uh, you know, drone strike and special forces war. Right. Right. Uh, let me just, you know, put some meat on the bones of that, because it's it's I think it's utterly decisive to understanding where we, where we are, because I'd go so far as to say there have been two wars on terror. The first inaugurated directly after 9-11 uh, intervention, occupation, two places, big American uh, troop commitments. Um, and it was brutal. Um, it was, it was brutal because George W. Bush decided to make it so, and his lawyers lifted the, the emergent requirements to fight war humanely. And as a result, the, the stabilized second new form of the war on terror didn't just shift in the direction, you know, surge notwithstanding, of uh, fewer tr troops, more tools like armed drones and special forces, but also the legitimation of not fighting brutally. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was of enormous importance. And you remember this, that uh, on day one of his presidency, Obama ordered the shredding of John Hughes torture memos, not his use of force memos. Um, and people ran big Victory laps around the end of the war on terror that week. And so John, his, you can, can I just add? So he absolutely. was in the, a lawyer in the Bush administration who wrote these famous memos justifying torture, but also you're saying justifying a broad conception of when we can attack people. In other words, a broad Correct. conception of initiating conflict and kind of consistent with your thesis. What got all the attention was his memos on torture, on how humane we can be and not his memos on when we can initiate conflict. Absolutely right. And I think that was for a few reasons. I mean, there was a strategic choice amongst activists at a time of patriotic lockdown to challenge the conduct of the war on terror, not its existence. But um, noble as that was, necessary as it was, um, it, it, it involved a dividend for Obama because he understood in his Nobel speech, in his speech four years later, rolling out the humane drone policy that, you know, he could capitalize on kind of the restoration of humanity to American war and saying, we're now fighting it morally um, mm -hmm. 
And so this was, this is the risk I'm concerned about. And I think we should avoid kind of setting it up and resting on our laurels because in the end, there are still these wars of choice since 1945 that seem to set America back and the world back. And that's what our ancestors once cared about, you know, Mm -hmm. keeping war from breaking out, not so much or only how it's conducted once it starts. By our ancestors, you mean our peacenik ancestors the, the, uh, in the peacenik lineage? Well, there are those, but also policymakers who are answering to kind of the, the popular groundswell around peace, notably mm-hmm. after World War II. They hold the Nuremberg trials. They brand National Socialist aggressors. Uh, and that's what the Nuremberg trials are principally about, not atrocity. In mm-hmm. Vietnam, there's a peace movement. International laws invoked and the Nuremberg parallel is invoked, I think, more accurately than we've done uh, either in the name of non-aggression, not in the name of preventing atrocities alone. And Mm -hmm. then something shifted. Mm -hmm. Now, this Obama uh, kind of shift the drone strikes. I I started thinking it was during the Obama administration that I started thinking that we have kind of an incentive problem here, which is that it is in the political, you know, the, the political interest of the president to stop terrorist attacks in the short run. It, he's not going to pay a political price if the way he stops the attacks sows the seeds for even more terrorism in the right. long run. And given the fact that the war on terror has tended to expand to more and more countries, whether we're training troops, stationing special forces, doing drone strikes, um, you know, one could conclude that indeed, uh, although, you know, presidents have done a pretty good job uh, of, of preventing attacks, terrorist attacks, at least that begin that are initiated from without our borders, from beyond our borders. Um, it may be that uh, they're just creating a larger problem in the, in the long run. I'm curious if that's your assessment as well. It is. I mean, I, I, I think that it's, it's worth kind of, kind of reconstructing the kind of incentive structure, because if we want to change it, we have to know what's involved. And Obama is a wonderful example, because he was so kind of meditative and reflective about the countervailing, um, you know, in, in incentives that he experienced. So I think, you know, I would start by noting that he was the first president in a series that's now reached three that can gain considerable electoral legitimation by selectively opposing American wars, including large aspects of the war on terror. That's how Obama beat Hillary Clinton in the primaries uh, and won in 2008. It's how Donald Trump, shockingly at the time amongst Republicans, could beat his Republican rivals by condemning the Iraq war, claiming falsely that he'd always done so, uh, and then beating Hillary Clinton again, you know, for a multitude of reasons. But I think this was in the mix, especially if we consider um, discontented veterans. And then Joe Biden uh, condemning the forever war in his campaign. So that's there. But of course, there's this other incentive not to allow terrorism uh, in, in the homeland uh, ever again. Now, it, 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 it's, it makes sense then that someone like Biden would stop the most visible forms in the tradition of Obama and Trump of endless war and keep the less visible forms. But I still think Obama had it right when he reflected that um, fewer people die from you know, cross-border terrorism than from slipping in the bathtub. Uh, or uh, from dying, you know, by texting on the road, or since you alluded to it yourself, from domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. Uh, And once we do the kind of public education to to construe terrorism from abroad as a, a kind of more boring regulatory threat than we've treated it, maybe we recognize that we don't want to do things like create more terrorists in the name of interdicting them and mm-hmm. paying all the costs that the war on terror has involved, including this counter, you know, terrorist form purified uh, with drones 
special forces and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe causing other forms of, of blowback and domestic catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And as far as the domestic terrorism, I think it's, you know, uh, in terms of so-called homegrown jihadist terrorism that is done by people who are here already, not by people who are sent in from Al Qaeda or anything and people who got radicalized here. I think it's a case that, uh, you know, Pulse Nightclub, Boston Marathon and so on. It, if, if you I, I think most of the Americans who have been killed in these things have been killed by people who explicitly cited the application of American military force abroad to kill Muslims as part of their motivation. So that exactly. this doesn't get much discussion, but I think uh, and, and I, I personally think that's a case where the the the, the danger of that goes beyond the numbers. Right. It, it, it's like once there's a real cost paid when Americans start looking around at Muslims who live here with suspicion because a very small number of them have done uh, horrible things. Absolutely. And, you know, you could extend that case to abroad, I believe. I mean, the, the best reporting has shown that the, the government we were supporting in Afghanistan lost credibility amongst Afghans, especially outside urban areas because of the drone strike. Mm -hmm. And that that's just ordinary people, you know, not even to speak of the the, the scores of terrorists, the drone strikes help recruit mm -hmm. um and i'm i'm not sitting here with like a claim that we can have some other easy means um to interdict genuine threats i do think there's an educational mission to and and obama again brilliantly in his national defense university address in 2013 about drone policy said you have to accept some risk and a war on terror is an endless proposition that you can't ever win. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you're, com but you're completely right that in the domestic context, we, we've forgotten um, the, the genuine cost of being at war, even in the humane, invisible way we, we now are even more so in the purified form mm -hmm. after the Afghan withdrawal. So one kind of extrapolation you make from the current uh, situation is the idea of this evolving, and, and in a way it's already there, but uh, evolving into something that looks less like uh, war abroad, kind of very pre precision warfare in a lot of places, and, and, and looks more like policing action, like we. Uh, you know, the U.S. just declares itself global police or police over a very large realm. Talk about that. And, and uh, I mean, is that more of a metaphor or kind of a, a you know, a, an actual thing that would that would that would that would represent some change in the legal status of this or what? And what is it that bothers you about it? So, you know, one, one line of of kind of worry about this argument that war is becoming more humane is that it's still very brutal. And of course, that's true. I'm just making a claim about change over time, that these legal standards and changing moral expectations that have you know, driven the legal change actually had implications for fighting and, 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 and altered its form. Um, you know, a great example would be when Trump ordered uh, the killing of the leader of the Islamic State. And when our special forces landed, that was up close and in person, their first act is to you know, separate the innocent. Uh, and he took a couple of his family down the corridor with them. They had to die. But it's, it's kind of amazing in historical perspective, the care mm -hmm. that our, our killers Mm -hmm. um, you know, ex 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 distribute to our enemies as part of the killing process. Yeah. Now, where is this going? So you talked before about some of the features of, of this new form of war. I think we have to add surveillance, which has now been baked in uh, after the war on terror. You know, lots of states conducted in ways that, that would have been considered 
terrifying mm-hmm. before. And what what's involved in a lot of drone activity is actually not killing, um, but just kind of information gathering and monitoring. And we have reports of you know people in borderland areas and elsewhere who you know have never seen a drone strike, but they see drones daily um, on their horizons or buzzing above. And um, you know there there's there are some reformers who want to say accepting this endless war why don't we kind of make it more like domestic policing imposing standards for example the standard that um that at, that that um your enemies have to be captured in preference to killing them if it's feasible or the standard that you have to invite surrender of a target rather than kill mm-hmm. um, immediately. And to me, this is frightening because it's it's showing us that what's at stake in in this is not just like mindless killing. It's a kind of global permanent security mm-hmm. regime, um, which is is about killing only kind of when absolutely necessary, just like in policing. And I, I'm just kind of voicing the, the view of those critics of policing in our country who respond to the brutality by not asking for more humane policing, but less policing, because it's really about relation amongst different groups of people. And I think we're learning or relearning that that's w- what war is. For all the death that's been part of it, it's it's we're getting a form of it that's revealing its 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 face as kind of domination and control and and security. That's the hope. At least. Okay. The uh, and it does seem to me that if it's true, as I think we both suspect, that at least as it, as this is being conducted now, it may be making the problem worse, and so increasing the demand for itself. Uh, you know, if you're creating more and more people who hate you and we're in a technological era where somebody with access to a, to a, you know, a good university biological laboratory can create like a biological weapon, you know, there, it is at least technologically possible for a very small number of people to kill a very large number of people. It seems to me Correct. a good strategy would just to start tamping down the hatred now instead Correct. of expanding it. I'm with you. So, you know, it, 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 and I think our best argument is, is in that direction to say, look, you're worsening the problem you're setting out to solve. Now, I think it's still wrong, even if it were solving it, you know, because I think there, there have to be better methods of interdiction, even if the ones we're using now work, because the ones we're using now involve um, these new forms of permanent security kind of on a, on a deterritorialized scale that we would reject if we were subject to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they sweep in vast swaths of humanity who aren't trying to attack the United States. Um, and so, but absolutely, I think it, the, the key is to emphasize that, you know, for, for, you know, if only for strategic reasons, that it seems like we're setting our own interests back, not just the interests of, 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 of target population. Yeah, no, I think, I think so. And, and, and the planet's interest. Um, now, now it's your view that I think that Trump's election would have been less likely, uh, had it not been for the trends you described. Is that uh, fair? I, so I, I think it's, it's really important in, in a couple of stages that he was able to express exasperation and fatigue with the war on terror. First, in that amazing South Carolina debate when he condemned the Iraq war. And if you look at the press the day after, all the kind of Washington pundits say he's done. Right. And just the reverse, he that was his breakthrough moment. Um, and then, you know, Hillary Clinton has lost twice. First against Obama and second against Trump. And her her um, she was she was not a foe of war, um, including the Iraq war. And uh, however mendacious Trump 
claim to be, and it, it could have, have been one factor amongst others. I'll just mm-hmm. add that, you know, for all our, you know, righteous indictment of the man, um, he did attempt before Biden succeeded to draw forces out of Afghanistan and did so in Somalia mm-hmm. um, in ways that were deeply troubling to, um, you know, the the establishment, which could be the military uh, itself or the kind of national security expert blob. Um, and I'm not a defender of, of Trump, but I think he represents a certain view that has much more popular support than elite support about, you know, American entanglement abroad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also think, you know, there, there were some big uh, homegrown terrorist attacks during, not long before the election, there was both nightclub and I think maybe San Bernardino. I think maybe if you take those away, I mean, they contributed to the sense of things being out of control that he exploited. Correct. Um, so uh, why don't we step back at this point uh, and, and talk about the, the history you trace? Uh, uh, let me let me give a, a capsulized uh, version of part of it and see what you think. So first of all, you start out with Tolstoy, who it turns out was, in your view, prescient. He actually envisioned the possibility that uh, the drive to make more war more humane would make people in some sense more tolerant of the phenomenon of war. Um, then uh, you, you kind of trace both, I guess, the, the cultural uh, manifestation of uh, an emphasis on making war more humane and certainly the, the legal, the manifestation in legal circles, uh, per, you know, in, in international law circles. And basically things kind of wax and wane for much of the 20th century. Right. It's like, uh, you know, um, you have these two wars that are so big and horrible that I guess both of them uh, rejuvenate the emphasis on just ending war. Right. So in the wake of World War One, you get the League of Nations and in the wake of World War Two, you get United Nations. Um, Then you see Vietnam as. not the big pivot, maybe, but a kind of a something starts to change. Uh, those of us old enough to remember the My Lai massacre, which you talk about, where hundreds of uh, villagers were slaughtered, um, know that that was a huge deal. Uh, say say a little about uh, about about that that part of the the transition. Sure. Yeah. So everything you said is is spot on, and and I I think. You know, I, I give Tolstoy some love just because he was there at the kind of present at the creation of the whole idea of making war humane. And I think he he got Obama right. He just was too early because for for the century in between, you know, war was brutal. The laws of war didn't do much to change the equation and a kind of peace movement that Tolstoy have helped inspire. Um, all the way down to Martin Luther King in Vietnam actually made a dent in in war. So Vietnam figures in in this account for a couple reasons, and and it's both worth mentioning both. First, uh, the My Lai massacre is revealed by the same reporter who helps reveal American atrocities after 9-11 at Abu Ghraib and elsewhere. Seymour Hirsch. The, the Seymour Hirsch, but the result is, let's say, opposite because um, there's a big pre-existing anti-war movement in in you know 1969, and and if you like, atrocity adds fuel to the its fire, and it helps curtail not atrocity but the war. Whereas the reverse happens after uh, Abu Ghraib when there's 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 a debugging of endless war, torture and, and detainee abuse is removed. Uh, and Obama set up to continue the war on a humane basis. The other reason that I think it's really important to kind of get Vietnam in the story is what happens after when American elites, including military elites, are much more open to taking legal constraints on the fighting of war seriously than they have been ever before. 
You know, mm-hmm. there had been unrestricted air war and the law changes for internationally for a few reasons in the 1970s having to do with decolonization. Um, and there are constraints put on air war, which are going to be central to drone regulation. Um, and the military kind of st- signs up in the aftermath of Milai for fighting more humanely. Um, and the story I tell really is how when John Yu comes on the scene after 9-11, it's kind of as a last gasp of this mm-hmm. old American tradition that's been fundamentally challenged since Vietnam, including in the heartlands of military culture. Um, and in a sense, it's it's not hard to get back to humane war. The trouble is that... So you mean his justification of torture is a last gasp of, of this kind of indifference to the humaneness of war? Correct. And and we know that that actually within the Bush administration, not just the State Department, but the Pentagon, Colin Powell and others were 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 very upset by what David Addington and 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 other uh, others of these, uh, you know, um, guys who just insisted on taking the gloves off were doing. Um, Mm -hmm. And it it's not to at all trivialize what happened or the struggle the noble struggle people outside and inside the government to like put things right. But it, it was crucial that they were restoring something, a kind of new culture since Vietnam of, uh, of, of minimizing suffering and war and taking international legal constraints on how you fight more seriously, even mm-hmm. as across that same period, as I narrate, America, America less and less took serious, seriously this, the international constraints on going to war, mm-hmm. which never gained much traction after 9-11, sadly. Yeah, I mean, you do. This is, a, as you said, a big distinction of yours that uh, My Lai became part of the rhetoric for ending the war. Uh, Abu Ghraib... Uh, was was played out differently. It, 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 it was it was more about making the occupation more humane and so on. I mean, I would say at the same time there is there was well first of all there was some op- uh, opposition to the Iraq War uh, right. in, in advance. Right. There was the, one thing the two have in common is there was a kind of a retrospective consensus that the wars had been a mistake, right? Right. Um, but that still uh, but but your point is that in real time, the way the Abu Ghraib thing played out was not to. Well, well, it didn't invigorate a move uh, to withdraw. Right. No, I mean, you had kind of a couple of different, you know, sites of anti-war pressure. One was folks who kind of understood or, you know, that that one way to stigmatize a war is stigmatizing its brutalities and thought they were going to curtail war by focusing on torture, et cetera. And then you had like veterans and veterans families, Cindy Sheehan. But Obama's election really is a huge blow to anti-war pressure because everyone gives them tons of credit for not being George W. Bush. And, you know, just as we now do give him credit for not being his successor, Donald (laughs) John Trump. And that gave him room for maneuver uh, that he exploited, I think, brilliantly um, to continue the war and claim its humanity, which is, you know, as I try to show absolutely at the rhetorical center of his major addresses, notably the Nobel Address and the National Defense University Address four years later on humane drug mm-hmm. policy. So it's, it, it, that is a radically different outcome. You know, after Vietnam, the Democrats had a big war about whether to remain in the Cold War posture. Uh, and though George McGovern was defeated with lasting consequences for the Democrats, it was very hard for a generation to start wars of choice. That's not what happened under Obama's watch when many were begun. Yeah. If you define the beginning of a war as violence deployed in a new country. Correct. Um, uh, or just separate. I mean, again, there's a metastasizing war on terror, but there's also the Libyan intervention, right? Which is a totally separate uh, and equally dreadful. Or now that's worse. an interesting case because 
you know, the initial intervention had the authority, you know, was lawful in the sense that it had this right. authority of security council. That was a humanitarian justification. Right. And I don't know your view. It, it seems to me that once it morphed into a regime change operation and beyond a civilian pre- protection operation, it it violated certainly the spirit of the U.N. mandate and, and possibly the the. The letter of the law. I, I don't know if uh, what your view is on that as a lawyer. It's hard to make that case, but we can say that you know China and Russia learned an important lesson, and it, and there were grievous consequences for civilians in Syria because never could the Security Council agree on a humanitarian course hmm. when it came to civilian atrocities, which were actually real. We don't know what Gaddafi would have done. Yeah, um, and they were much worse. And. You know, the results in Libya, which is now like super militarized with, pro- you know, Russian and Turkish proxies all over, um, were were just absolutely grotesque. And of course, you know, Syrians, uh, without getting into detail on what all went on there, um, you know, paid a part of the price for the, the kind of steps beyond protecting the gates of Benghazi to actually engage in one more, you know, foolhardy regime change. Right. So you're so you're um, so you're saying, to be clear on Libya, that you think probably you could come up with a legal justification even for the regime change because of the by any means necessary phrasing in the resolution. But it was still uh, a kind of in, in violating the spirit of the resolution. It was kind of an abuse of international law that came back to haunt us in a lot of ways. I'd go further than that, you know. It, it was the first and so far only UN Security Council resolution that that cited this newfangled doctrine of the responsibility to protect, to protect, which in a sense it it made illegitimate because so many people, I'm one of them, understood that to be a potential great power pretext for regime change, which mm-hmm. means that you know who's going to vote for that again? Who's going to support it? And it's sad because, of course. Civilian depredations at the hands of their own government are a genuine problem we ought to care about and do something about. But when the first time you have a chance to experiment with it, you actually, you know, go beyond the resolution and and make the situation of civilians themselves in a country worse. Mm -hmm. Well, you're 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 setting up a future of non-intervention. And that's what we saw in Syria and elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, we could have a whole nother conversation on uh, America's abuse of international law, both in the sense of applying it selectively and just ignoring it at other times. Um, right. Uh, but uh, and I think we touched on that a little in our last conversation. So your 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 uh, your history is is very much it's a it's a kind of a history of ideas, largely in international law, a cultural history to some extent. Uh, and I want to ask. Um, well, if that's really where the action has been, in a sense, I mean, there is the view uh, that, you know, these lofty ideas in in uh, in law are often just kind of, you know, epiphenomenal reflections of material things on the ground. You, you get that both from Marxists on the one hand and from libertarians, actually, who say that international treaties are epiphenomenal. They don't have any actual effect on things. They just reflect. Uh, kind of power arrangements uh, on the ground. Um, And one can certainly uh, think of uh, surely technological trends that could have the same effects you describe, and and you acknowledge some. I I would think of two, uh, and uh, I I know, I'm I'm sure you acknowledge one, maybe the second. Um, One is just the fact that we can uh, apply force in increasingly surgical fashion. It is possible to to execute war uh, more and more humanely in that sense with fewer civilian casualties. The other, uh, it seems to me, is the technology for documenting the atrocity. It's like, uh, you know, Biden describes our, our capabilities as kind of over the horizon, which kind of suggests, I'm sure, you know, probably unintentionally, the, the kind of out of sight, out of mind uh, thing that, 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 is maybe the key to the continuation of this kind of drone war and so on. But the fact is, it's getting harder and harder to make casualties out of out of sight. And, uh, you know, the TV played a famously important role in Vietnam by documenting that. Um, 
you note that it was the appearance of, I think in your book, the photographs of Milai, not just the reporting about it that had an impact. And now you've got a situation where everything gets photographed everywhere in the world, if not videoed. So uh, wh- wh- how do you sort out these different effects? You've got technological effects, pushing things in the direction you describe, and then you've got stuff happening culturally and in yep. law. It, it's a great question, Bob. I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming that law drives events. You know, I, I, I think it's interesting to tell its story, um, in, if only because, you know, elites, including kind of presidents, um, like talk about it. And, and, and it is really significant that Obama is the kind of president who gives more love in public to this branch of law, international humanitarian law than anyone before. And even if we think it's not causal, it's still like out there in public to help us kind of think through ethics and politics. And I think, you know, the distinction that I dwell on, as you said, is maybe too much in law between the rules that tell you when you can start a war and the rules that tell you what you can do once you're in it are very clear to people. And, you know, we can, we can think about which are more important and decide whether we've lost focus on one at the expense of the other. But ultimately I'm, I'm with you that culture matters. You know, I tell a story where really in, in the middle of the post war period, you know, I think Americans, like everyone else, really kind of um, rethought war, which had once been a heroic enterprise. And the, the sense that there were victims on the other side was kind of not that important. Um, you know, the Holocaust became so central retroactively to our collective understanding, not just of World War II, mm-hmm. but of what's at stake in international politics, what goes wrong? And that set up a whole culture in which laws proposing to purge cruelty from the world could really matter to a lot of people far beyond just, you know, some boring uh, lawyers. Mm -hmm. I can see totally that, you know, you ought implies can and technology mattered utterly in this transformation. I just think it's still the case that, you know, at one point, we asked our scientists and uh, and so forth to make napalm, and now we order a drone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's more on us um, than just a, a kind of objective story of their changing capacities. Mm-hmm. The only thing I disagree w- with with you about is is that factor that you would emphasize more than I would, which has to do with um, knowledge and 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 media kind of media access to victimhood because the story i try to tell in part because of like the significance of race in um kind of the understanding of kind of the the violence of of the powerful and wealthy states for a long time is that it, it wasn't that people didn't know about kind of massive victimhood it's that they thought it was just and righteous Mm -hmm. Um, And that changed. And to some extent, you know, um, violence that would have been seen as as, you know, unimportant morally was was kind of reclassified. And Milai was a a big event in that regard. Abu Ghraib, um, you know, another. And I think we're in a sense in early days because we're we're still in a world where there's very little great power war. There's very little war in which um white christians are victims um and it it religion and race seem really important in thinking about why violence happens some places rather than others but we've still kind of come a long way and and media is kind of adapting itself to that change Mm -hmm. as much as driving it now i i think you're hopeful about actually ending forever wars at least you think it's it's possible enough to uh be worth the fight and i can i can make this the last question but um the uh the you know and and, and uh that would take a lot but um i i, I yeah. guess it, it would t- because it might take a president who's willing to incur short-term risk 
Uh, I personally think the risk is overstated. I su- I suspect that if you just ended all drone strikes and pulled the, the special forces back, you, you'd find that there were remarkably few actual threats to the United States out there. But that aside, uh, it, it seems right now like a pretty big political lift, given the fact that most Americans aren't thinking about it at all sure. really anymore. And, and most presidents think better safe than sorry and so on, all presidents. Um, what makes you hopeful about uh, actually uh, completely reigning in the forever wars? Well, I'm not hopeful. I mean, I, I agree with you that it's almost unthinkable that no. <laughs> any anyone on force would. Give we want up. to close on a message of hope, Sam. America well, longs know, for so, a message so of hope. I, 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 you know, the book dwells on the earlier period so much because there was a different America before World War II. Um, And it was one that was very skittish about at least some forms of intervention. Um, And it was one in which peace movements were much more prominent than they ended up being in the Cold War with the, and since with the lone exception of the Vietnam War and that big day right before the Iraq War when so many people, including myself, were were on the streets. Um, I think, you know, I'm actually surprised about the change since I finished this book, which is only a year ago, Mm -hmm. in how how much more mainstream the ideas in it have become, not thanks to me, but just because of exhaustion and kind of reflection on the 20th anniversary and the kind of, you know, recognition of the futility of the war on terror with Mm -hmm. the Afghan withdrawal and the, the, you know, the, the reacquisition by the Taliban of the power, which we deprived it for, you know, a bit. And so I think there's an opening. Um, it, it, it can begin grassroots, but it can also begin in like the spaces in which I'm involved in kind of getting elites to think differently. I think Mm -hmm. honestly, for many liberals, the shock of seeing Donald Trump elected have has has gotten them to rethink the kinds of powers that they awarded the president when they thought um, mm. it would it would always be someone they knew, even if it was in the other party. And I think that's the single biggest um, mm. kind of kind of transformative factor for elites. And we have to see where that goes. OK, well, we'll, we'll take that as our closing message of hope. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thanks, Sam. So again, the, the book is Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. Uh, it's getting a lot of favorable attention in, in important places. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and where can people find you on Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? At, at Samuel Moyne. That's M-O-Y-N-E, correct? No, no, no E. No, no E at the end. Right. Just okay. Now. Important clarification. And no, no space between the names, right? No, in- no, just one long. Okay. Okay. That a letter. All right. Thanks so I much. I really appreciate it, Bob. It's always a, a privilege to talk to you. I always enjoy it. Uh, keep okay. up. Keep up the good work.